Welcome to NTD News Today. Here are today's stories. How does the Chinese Communist Party threaten global security by supporting U.S. adversaries? Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo testifies today before a House committee. President Biden weighing his response after three American service members were killed in a drone attack in Jordan. He's under increasing pressure to confront Iran directly. We have analysis. Washington and Beijing launching talks about a crackdown on fentanyl. It's the first sign of cooperation on combating illegal drugs in two years. What we know about the newly formed counter-narcotics working group. OpenAI's ChatGPT allegedly breaches data protection rules in Italy. The chatbot has already been banned there once before. Northern Ireland's Democratic Unionist Party is planning to end a two-year boycott. We bring you their new agreements after the boycott caused the government to co collapse. Hungary's foreign minister is seeking to improve relations with Ukraine, meeting with top officials in Kyiv. This after Budapest blocked EU funding for Ukraine for months. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. Hi, I'm David Lamb, sitting in for Chris Beers. And to begin the show, we have tensions remaining high in the Middle East as the Biden administration mulls its response to the deadly drone attack in Jordan. NTD's Daniel Monahan has the latest developments on the attack that killed and wounded U.S. service members. President Biden is under increasing pressure to respond in a way that stops these attacks for good. Iran-backed militants have targeted U.S. military facilities in Iraq and Syria over 160 times since October. The U.S. has in recent months carried out several strikes, targeting Iranian proxies' weapons depots in Iraq and Syria. To date, none of those strikes have deterred the militants. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says tensions in the Middle East are the highest they've been in over 50 years. We will respond decisively to any aggression. And we will hold responsible the people who attacked our troops. We'll do so at a time and a place of our choosing. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg says Iran is repressive at home and aggressive abroad and is destabilizing the whole region. Tehran's behavior reminds us uh, of uh, what a world without rules uh, look uh, like. Unpredictable and dangerous. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin expressed outrage and sorrow for those fallen and injured in the line of duty. The president and I will not tolerate attack on U.S. forces, and we will take all necessary actions to defend the U.S. and our troops. Allison McManus from the Center for American Progress says the strikes on U.S. service members represent a fundamental change in the rules of engagement. This is the first time that we've seen fatalities of U.S. service members, and that's absolutely not going to be something that this administration or the Pentagon takes lightly. McManus is concerned by calls for more all-out aggressive posturing with Iran, including from some in Congress. This absolutely has implications for for day to day lives of Americans. The Pentagon has released the identities of the three troops killed: Sergeant William Rivers, Specialist Kennedy Sanders, and Specialist Brianna Moffitt. They are all from the same unit based out of Fort Moore, Georgia. The drone strike that killed them originated from an aircraft that approached their outpost at the same time an American drone was returning. Officials say that led to uncertainty over whether it was hostile and caused a delay to the U.S. response. More than 40 people were injured in the incident. The Iranian Foreign Ministry spokesman denied involvement, saying that the militant groups act on their own initiative. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. The parents of the American soldiers killed in Sunday's drone attack are sharing their grief after losing their children so suddenly. Three Army reservists paid the ultimate price in Sunday's Middle East drone attack. The parents of Specialist Kennedy Sanders said she fully enjoyed her life and deployment. The 24-year-old had volunteered for the Middle East deployment, eager to see a new part of the world. So I just want people to remember that, you know, even though her time was short on Earth, 
she lived her life to the fullest and she enjoyed her life in any situation that she was in. She made it enjoyable, even being deployed. The parents of 23-year-old specialist Brianna Moffitt said this was her first deployment. She joined the Army Reserve right after high school. They, she left in August of um, 2023. She, she, she was, this is her first deployment, so she didn't know what to expect. 46-year-old Sergeant William Jerome Rivers had far more military experience than the two young women. He joined the Army Reserve in 2011 and served a nine-month tour in Iraq in 2018. Rivers had several awards and decorations, including the Army Achievement Medal, the National Defense Service Medal, and the Global War on Terrorism Service Medal. His family has not been reached yet. All three soldiers were from the 718th Engineer Company, based at Fort Moore, Georgia. Georgia Governor Brian Kemp issued a statement mourning the inexcusable loss of life of the three soldiers, saying they gave the last full measure of devotion in service to this country. And here to speak with us about the attack in Jordan and other attacks on U.S. and allied targets in the region is Abraham Hamaday. A former Army intelligence officer and now a U.S. House candidate for Arizona. Abe, welcome. We're seeing calls from both sides of politics to put an end to these attacks, either with strikes or with more holistic sanctions and other policy approaches. What are President Biden's likely options and which would be the most effective in your judgment? Well, first of all, my heart goes out to all these soldiers who were killed in the attack. And also, we can't forget there was two Navy SEALs who went missing and declared dead last week. So this this war that we don't think we're a part of is escalating very quickly. The Biden administration, they're running out of options, quite frankly, Stefania, because if you're looking at what's happening, there is no strategic deterrence anymore. No matter what the Biden administration does at this point, I think our enemies are going to be looking at that and trying to continue to test our abilities. Because, you know, when the Houthis were firing missiles in the Red Sea just a few months ago. I, I was calling for to classify them as a terrorist organization back then, but the Biden administration has waffled so many times. They, they want to negotiate with the Iranians, and I think the Iranians at this point know that they have the upper hand. So I think there needs to be limited strikes clearly in Yemen to take out the Houthis' capability in Iraq, where I believe that this drone that killed three of our three of our troops probably originated from Iraq. It's too early to tell, but this, the, from an intelligence perspective, this is very common with the Iraqi militia. And make no mistake, this is Iranian funded. Iran has been given the Houthis these really sophisticated missiles in Yemen. They're getting the drone technology in Iraq to this militia. So Iran has their hands on all over the Middle East right now, and the Biden administration seems to have allowed it to happen. And so are you saying that there's no specific way that we can ensure there, there's, we don't trigger a broader conflict with our response? Unfortunately, right now, I believe the Biden administration has lost its credibility. And when you, have, when you lose that credibility on the world stage, it's very difficult to get back unless, there is a, a, unless it escalates into a, a bigger strike. You know, when President Trump was in office, the reason why you know, people feared him, if you look, Qasem Soleimani, the head of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, you know, he was actually in Baghdad trying to plan an attack on our embassy. And what did President Trump do? Against the advice on so many advisors and allies, he actually took a strike and took him out. And that was a big wake up call to these Middle Eastern dictators that, you know, President Trump meant business. What has Biden done since October 7th with Israeli, uh, when Israel came under attack by Hamas, the Biden administration has really sent mixed signals. And so I think it's going to be very difficult for this administration to bring back its strategic deterrence in the region. Uh, this alluded... administration seems to be alienating our allies, emboldening our enemies. And I think right now they're clearly putting Americans in harm's way. Abe, you alluded to uh, various other issues within the region and involving the U.S. Strikes in the Red Sea are continuing. Uh, we, we do know that China has ambitions to increase its influence in the region, and it does have some sway with Iran. Uh, but it has been cautious about its response to the Red Sea attacks. How do you evaluate China's approach to this particular crisis that's happening there? 
well, they're, they're really benefiting the most from all of this because there's no cost to them. You know, when I was serving overseas in Saudi Arabia, I served under both President Trump and President Biden. And the Saudis would tell me, that, you know, when Biden took office, they said, you know, we could always align ourselves with China. And it seems to me making very clearly that our allies in the region, that you know, these allies that we've had for decades are kind of shifting because the United States have, has alienated them. So I think it's, it poses a huge risk to have China right now kind of benefiting the most because we're so distracted. We can't form alliances to protect global trade where so much of the trade crosses into the Red Sea, into the Suez Canal. So you know, I'm very concerned this administration has lost all of its credibility and its legitimacy on the foreign policy stage. I, I've called for Antony Blinken to resign. I think he's done a terrible job as Secretary of State. So, you know, China, and make no mistake, our border, our open border down here in Arizona, you know, this is going to cause a lot of havoc. You know, the three, the three soldiers who were killed, unfortunately, it was almost inevitable. There's been 150 attacks on service members in the Middle East. Well, what are we going to do about our border that's being invaded right now with so many people that we have no idea who's coming across? And by the way, so many of them are Chinese spies who are coming in. And for me, in my district, my congressional district, we have TSMC, which was the largest semiconductor chip manufacturer. And so I believe, you know, in my district, there's going to be a lot of Chinese spies gathering intel as well. So this is a very scary situation for the United States. All right. Thank you so much, Abraham Hamaday, former Army intel officer and Republican candidate for Congress in Arizona. Thank you so much. Thank you. A friend of mine, she told me about Bonatti. He was the only one to address all four deaths as quickly as possible. And if you're to that point where you can't take it anymore, like I was, do your research, find out who the best is, and get it done. Visit askbonatti.com. Shen Yun Creations, the streaming platform from Shen Yun, featuring world-class dance, past programs, and all original music. Masterclasses, behind the scenes, comedy, and more. Explore ShenYunCreations.com. Hi, I'm Susan Lucci. I never thought about heart disease until I had my own heart event. I received two stents in my arteries, stents developed through research funded by the American Heart Association. Those stents saved my life. I have met so many survivors. Each of them tells a story that can be so helpful to women out there. Everything was pretty good. It was a very happy life. I was given the diagnosis that I had peripartum cardiomyopathy, which is basically a pregnancy-induced heart failure. They told me my only chance was a heart transplant. And the American Heart Association helped make that possible. Their research helped save me. I think everyone should support the American Heart Association. Call now or go to helpheart.org. For only $19 a month, just 63 cents a day, you can help fund the next medical breakthrough. Get the next person trained in CPR. The next hospital certified in high quality cardiovascular care. You can be part of that very important work that the American Heart Association is doing to save lives everywhere. Give $19 a month with your credit card and we'll send you this special t-shirt that you can wear to show that you are helping save lives. I'm grateful for just every day that I get with my children. I am very thankful for the American Heart Association. Heart disease is America's number one killer and your support now can help save your life or the life of someone you love. Listen to your heart. The only reason I'm here today is because I did. So please call the number on your screen or go to helpheart.org now. Join me as a monthly donor today and help save even more lives.
Join us on NTD Good Morning because we want you to stay informed. Kickstart your morning with the latest you missed overnight. Right, and don't forget that inspiration. Absolutely, so let's shine some light on the good news too. Tune in every weekday morning to NTD News. The Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party probing how the authoritarian regime supports American adversaries. It comes at a time of increasing geopolitical tensions, with China seeking a bigger role on the world stage. Let's watch. ...of Ukraine, the largest invasion of a neighboring country in Europe since World War II. Hamas has launched a surprise attack within Israel's borders overnight. Iran gives up to $100 million a year to Hamas. Xi Jinping says Taiwan will be reunified with China during his New Year's address. So 2024 must mark an inflection point. We stand at this crossroads. Whether to surrender to a sea of troubles, We'll do everything we can to deter. But the growing number of world conflicts and threats have strengthened ties between Moscow and Beijing. Pledging to shape a new world order. She told Putin that they are driving changes not seen in a century and will provide an alternative to Western influence. <laughs> Ibrahim Raisi's visit comes as both China and Iran strengthen their relationships with Russia. Both sides say they're opposed to a world order led by the United States and its allies. China is by far the most serious challenge to U.S. national security, with a power to reshape the international order to Beijing's liking. Both the People's Republic of China and Russia have the means to threaten our interests and our way of life. We're the last real superpower, and, and now China is a near peer-to-peer -peer adversary to us now. And of course their goal is to rebuild the empire. They're even putting outposts around us. They're buying up farmland in, in states here in, in the U.S. And even in some of these localities. We have uh, Chinese CCP-owned um, companies that are coming in and open shop on Main Street. An age of idealism has been replaced by a period of hard-headed realism. Old enemies are reanimated. New foes are taking shape. Battle lines are being redrawn. Russia is gathering its forces as it attempts to break Ukrainian defenses across the eastern Donetsk region. Russia is also receiving support from Iran. Ukrainian officials say Moscow has used hundreds of Iranian drones to hit civilian and military targets. And then there's China. The records show that Chinese state-owned companies provided Russian government-owned defense firms with navigation equipment, jamming technology, and jet fighter parts. Iran has increasingly turned its sights toward China. China is Iran's biggest trading partner and the only customer of its heavily sanctioned oil exports, plans made under a 25-year strategic agreement signed in 2021. According to the New York Times, the agreement calls for joint training and exercises, joint research and weapons development and intelligence sharing. An actively deepened defense cooperation with new member Iran. Iran-backed groups form a land bridge across the Middle East and connect in an alliance that Tehran calls the axis of resistance. Russian or Chinese firearms, relics from previous wars, that made their way into the hands of Hamas. The foundation of the world order being shaken to their core. To guarantee our freedoms, we must be prepared to deter. And as we work in concert to meet the authentic problems of our time, we will generate a vision and an energy which will demonstrate anew to the world the superior vitality and the strength of the free society. Well, thank you. First, a point of order. We have a hard stop at 11. So I'm going to be ruthless in enforcing time limits, uh, beginning with my own. I had a fancy prepared speech, but instead I'd like to tell a story that Secretary Panetta has heard me tell before, which is that when I was a freshman member of Congress with the Secretary's son, Jimmy, we had a meeting of the Problem Solvers Caucus, and we were listening to his wisdom, and uh, I piped up and I said, Mr. Secretary, what was the best job you ever had in Washington, D.C.? And in a response that would uh, simultaneously uh, inspire and depress me, uh, he said, the best job I ever had was being a member of Congress. He was a man who had had every great job in Washington, D.C., and he said, the best job he ever had was as a member of Congress because, and I quote him, there was a feeling you could get stuff done. 
And I'd like to think that uh, at a time when Congress is struggling to get much done, this committee has been an oasis of bipartisanship and at least an attempt to reinvigorate that spirit and that feeling that Secretary Panetta was talking about. We have two incredible public servants with us today, Secretary Pompeo as well, to provide their perspective on how we restore deterrence and meet the moment. And we are in a decisive moment for U.S. national security, for global security more broadly. Famously, Churchill called the period of German rearmament and alliance building the gathering storm. Today, the storm gathers once more, and as we watch China undertake the largest peacetime military buildup since at least World War II, and, we find, and it finds eager friends in Tehran, Moscow, and Pyongyang, we should reflect on the lessons of history. Problems, this is true in your personal life, as much as it is in geopolitics, problems do not age well. We ignore them at our peril. Appeasement or over-reliance on polite diplomacy cannot save us. We must act decisively to enhance our military strength, support our allies, and deter this authoritarian alignment. Only strength will be able to withstand the storm. Uh, again, we are privileged to have two uh, public servants, two former secretaries. Uh, Secretary Pompeo was Secretary of State and CIA Director uh, during the Trump administration. He also served the 4th District of Kansas in Congress from 2011 to 2017. Secretary Pompeo was the Director of uh, the CIA, as well as the Secretary of Defense under President Barack Obama. He had previously served as Chief of Staff for former President Bill Clinton, and in what was his best job, apparently, uh, as a member of Congress from California from 1977 to 1993. We thank both of you for making time out of your busy schedules to be here. If you could please stand and raise your right hand, I will now swear you in. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? So help you God. Let the record show the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Uh, thank you, Secretary Pompeo. You are recognized for your opening remarks. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member uh, Krishnam Turdi. It's great to be here. I uh, started my career at Canon 107, so it feels like home uh, very much. Um, it's a real privilege to be in front of this particular committee. You all are doing important, remarkable, bipartisan work, and I want to personally, on behalf of the Pompeo family, thank you, each of you, for doing that. It matters to my family, it matters to each American, and I bless you for that. You all have in front of you, much like I did in my time in Congress, important decisions. We have wars raging in Europe, in the Middle East. There's risk of one in South America, much closer to home even, and of course, the topic we're here today to talk about the challenges in the Pacific and Asia are in front of us as well. I, I know that you will endeavor to get these decisions right. Uh, you know, to start, I always try to get to the facts. I'm gonna try and do this in just three minutes. You know, we've, we've, we've got deterrence lost in Europe. We have deterrence lost in the Middle East. We are on the cusp of losing that very deterrent model in Asia as well. One could argue that elements of that have already been lost. Chairman Kim, who I spent way too much time with. Uh, Chairman Kim has now talked about the absence of any desire for peaceful reunification with the Republic of Korea. That is a change that is important. I was in Guyana two weeks ago. They are frightened by Maduro and his efforts to retake, in his words, much as Xi Jinping talks about reunifying, retake what is rightfully theirs. This is a challenge uh, that is linked not just about one of these theaters, one of these zones, one of these regions, but these are all deeply linked to whether America will have the resolved determination and capacity to deter and maintain the order that we have benefited, that Americans have benefited from since the post-Cold War order was established. Um, we, um, we know that this conflict largely begins with economics. Chinese Communist Party has been at war with the United States economy for at least 20 years, one could argue 40. It might well have made sense for the esteemed Dr. Kissinger to go and travel and open up relationships with the Chinese Communist Party back in 1972. It might have made sense in 1982. It made no sense by 2002, 2012, and certainly today makes no sense. It's dangerous for the United States to allow the Chinese Communist Party to have engaged here at home in ways that undermine the very foundations of our republic. And I know I'll get asked about this today, 
But I think it's important that when we think of the challenge from the Chinese Communist Party, we think not only about Taiwan, not only about the South Pacific and about the first island chain, but about Los Angeles and Denver and Washington, D.C. and Chicago and my home state of Kansas. The Chinese Communist Party is working diligently inside the gates to undermine everything it is that we stand for. When he talks about American decline, he is not doing so passively. He is an advocate. He is working to achieve that very American decline here at home. And the last thought, uh, Secretary Panetta, it is great to be with you here today. And I think it's important for America to see that this challenge is not remotely about politics. It is not remotely partisan. It is so much more fundamental than that. Uh, I, uh, I have been critical of many of President Biden's foreign policy actions, but I must say the work that they continue to do to confront the challenge of China I have approved and appreciated. I always knew that we could do more, they could do more as well, and I'm counting on this committee to help us get to that place. When we put sanctions in place, we can't immediately turn around and create loopholes. When we put in place economic orders that suggest how America ought to proceed, we cannot let our adversaries, whether they be from Russia, escape those sanctions regime, and we have to make sure that our friends comply with them as well. This will require temerity from each of us. The Chinese Communist Party is not about to give in because of some great speech that someone gives, some set of wonderful remarks, or a meeting, set of meetings held in San Francisco, or Beijing, or Washington, D.C. They, they are determined. They will push back against our actions, and we need to make sure that we hold the Chinese Communist Party at risk in the same way that they seek to put America at risk each day. If we get that piece right, the tactics, the operational pieces, we'll, we'll get those. A, a strong United States military, capable diplomatic corps, and a robust American economy can deliver those outcomes in a way that will give us the chance that 250 years from now, the 76th or 79th Secretary of State can sit here with his Democrat counterpart from a previous administration and still have the opportunity to defend what we hold most sacred. Thanks for giving me the chance to be with you all today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you for those great remarks. Secretary Panetta, you are now recognized for your opening statement. It's just clear as day. The media, whether it's broadcast, cable, or print media, has become extremely biased. And I started looking online for alternative ways to, to get information. And I saw an ad for a free trial. And I looked at it and I said, Epoch Times? I mean, come on, this is end of days type of stuff? I mean, what are they gonna be talking about here? And I said, well, it's a free trial, let me dig in. Is it giving me both sides? Is it giving me an objective point of view here? I have looked for opportunities to see where they might be biased, and I don't find it. It has given me a level of trust in media that I didn't think I'd ever get back. I love the Epic Times because it has renewed uh, my faith in the idea that a reliable, responsible, non-biased source of information is available. And I can say that I love it because of that. To a child, this is what conflict looks like. Children in Ukraine are caught in the crossfire of war, forced to flee their homes. A steady stream of refugees has been coming across all day. It's bitterly cold. Lacking clean water and sanitation, exposed to injury, hunger. Exhausted um, and shell-shocked from what they've been through. Every dollar you give can help bring a meal, a blanket, or simply hope to a child living in conflict. Please, call or go online to givenowtosave.org today with your gift of $10 a month. That's just 33 cents a day. We cannot forget the children in places like Syria, born in refugee camps, playing in refugee camps, thinking of the camps as home. Please, call or go online to givenowtosave.org today with your gift of $10 a month. Your gift can help children like Ara in Afghanistan, where nearly 20 years of conflict have forced the people into extreme poverty. Weakened and unable to hold herself up, Ara was brought to a Save the Children Center where she was diagnosed and treated for severe malnutrition. Every dollar helps. 
please call or go online to givenowtosave.org today with your gift of $10 a month, just 33 cents a day. And thanks to special government grants that are available now, every dollar you give can multiply up to 10 times the impact. And when you use your credit card, you'll receive this special Save the Children tote bag to show you won't forget the children who are living their lives in conflict. Every war is a war against children. Please give now. I'm Don Ma in New York City, and we are NTD News. We're tuning in to a House hearing on how the Chinese Communist Party provides support to the enemies of the United States. As we watch mounting tensions in the Middle East, the Russia-Ukraine war dragging on, North Korea continuing to test new weapons and voicing a new stance on South Korea, and China itself growing hungry to take Taiwan. Where does the Chinese Communist regime stand amidst these global dynamics? Let's tune back into the Select Committee on the CCP's hearing. The distinguished members of the committee, thanks for inviting me to testify uh, on the increasing threat posed by the People's Republic of China and its ongoing efforts to undermine the United States and allied interests around the world. And thank you for having me join with my good friend, uh, Mike Pompeo, uh, who we worked together when when he was uh, in my job at, uh, as director of the CIA and continued to be in touch during the time he was Secretary of State. And Mike and I are good friends and I'm glad that we are here to be able to present our views. I also want to thank this committee. The fact that you are a bipartisan committee working on this issue is incredibly important to our foreign policy. And I want to commend you for the work that you've done and particularly the report you issued on economic competition. Look, we live in a dangerous world in which tyrants and autocrats and terrorists are challenging and attacking democracies. And so they're threatening our values, they're threatening our interests and our national security. When Putin brutally invaded Ukraine, it was for no other reason but that he did not believe the people of Ukraine had the right to decide how to govern themselves. I believe Ukraine is fighting not just to protect their democracy, but to protect the concept of democracy in the 21st century. When Hamas attacked and brutally killed innocent men, women, and children in Israel, they, like Al-Qaeda on 9-11, made clear that they had no regard for the dignity of life. And Hamas's leadership does need to be destroyed, just as we targeted and destroyed Al-Qaeda leadership. We are facing an aligned group of dictators and autocrats from around the world, united in their determination to undermine our democracy. China is exploiting these conflicts to advance its own narrative of Western decline. She explicitly said the East is rising and the West is declining and that China will replace the United States as a world power. I've met with Xi multiple times during the time I was in office, here and in Beijing. He's smart, he can be very diplomatic, he's committed to an aggressive China. But it is important that we never underestimate Xi Jinping because he will use every opportunity to undermine the stability of the United States and the West. He will steal our intellectual property, conduct economic espionage, have extensive intelligence. I believe they planted malware within our own computer networks. He will use artificial intelligence for disinformation campaigns. He will militarize the, and continue to militarize the South China Sea. He will modernize the People's Liberation Army. They have the largest navy. They're producing large numbers of manned and unmanned aircraft, ICBMs. They're expanding their nuclear arsenal. They have 500 warheads, and they hope to double that by the end of the decade. 
As a result, they are not simply developing what could be called a general purpose military. They're developing a military that can employ the threat and the use of force. Xi Jinping recently said the reunification of the motherland is a historical necessity. And so there's no question they threaten Taiwan. The president was correct to say that we will defend Taiwan militarily if it comes to that. I have always believed strongly that when the U.S. gives its word, it must stand by its word. That is the essence of deterrence. The bottom line is we are facing an increasingly aligned group of autocrats around the world. And the fact is that they are now having dual-use technologies that are being spread with Russia, Iran, China, and North Korea. While this alignment of autocrats is troubling, the good news is that it does not even come close to approaching the strength and depth and breadth of the United States global network of allies and partners. Look, some have suggested that our relationship with China is improving, and there's no question we've had increased military and economic dialogue. But make no mistake, the only way to try to avoid war with China, the only way to deal with China is from strength, from strength. Both China and Russia became more aggressive when they sensed weakness on the part of the US. And for that reason, we must take strong action to arm and train Taiwan, train, train Taiwan to defend itself, to strengthen our force posture, to invest in the next generation of military technology, to bolster our, our alliances, and to maintain strong export controls on critical technologies. And I must say, we must demonstrate that our democracy is strong and that we can govern. For that reason, it is incredibly important that this Congress pass the supplemental request and provide necessary military aid to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. To fail would send a terrible message of weakness to adversaries and allies alike who will be playing China's game. And let me make clear that those who believe the United States can simply back away from our commitment in Ukraine, you cannot be weak on Ukraine and be tough on China. In conclusion, let me just say, I, I tell the students at the Panetta Institute that in our democracy, we govern either by leadership or by crisis. If we fail to provide leadership, then we will govern by crisis. And the price of that is the loss of the trust of the American people in our democracy. This committee provides hope that we can govern and work together in a real sense. Our democracy and our national security depend on each of you for your leadership necessary to govern and protect our country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, we've uh, released three major policy reports uh, that were the culmination of a year's worth of work, investigations, hearings, and member input. We're now trying to turn those into legislative reality. But I think perhaps the most important function of the committee is to try and explain to our colleagues and the American people why. why, why any of this matters. And for those who are in the D.C. Beltway, certainly those who work at think tanks, it may seem obvious why the defense of Taiwan uh, or the genocide in Xinjiang matters, but I'm not sure it's as obvious to m Americans who are just trying to live their lives. For example, I had 600 people come to a town hall in my district to talk about the lake sturgeon being listed as an endangered species, a huge issue for Northeast Wisconsin. I'm not sure I could get 20 people to come to, for a discussion about China. So I'd like to give both of you the opportunity to sort of answer for that, that, that everyday American who you've represented in your past job, why does this matter? Why should they care about the threat posed by the CCP? And I'll start with you, Secretary Pompeo. You know, Chairman Gallagher, it doesn't surprise me that you think that it might not be of as much interest to your constituents. I, I would describe this differently. I, I don't think these are two separate things. I'll hear people say, well, this is domestic policy and this is foreign policy. Today, they are so deeply interconnected. What happens in Kyiv doesn't stay there. What happens in Gaza doesn't stay there. These threats are real. We can see it on our southern border as well, right? There are bad actors trying to infiltrate our nation across that border as well. 
And then for, for the folks back in Kansas, so many American jobs depend on the fact that we will confront the Chinese Communist Party's efforts to destroy our manufacturing base, to steal our intellectual property. There are real economic outcomes for ordinary families all across America that depend on a United States that is prepared to defend its own economy, to create the rule of law, to have uh, trade lanes open, all of these things that somehow seem distant, they're right on top of us. Last piece, I talked about China inside the gates. You know, I, I, uh, we, we closed in the Trump administration the Chinese consulate in Houston, Texas. We, we didn't close it because we disliked them. We closed it because they were conducting what I believe is one of the largest espionage operations ever against the American people from that very facility. They're in our universities today, operating to steal our finest high-end research. These things matter to American economic growth for years in front of us. And if we get it wrong, then our children and grandchildren will live in America that looks fundamentally different. We can't permit that to happen. And so it is not about something 6,000 miles away. It is about something just down the street for you, your family, and your neighbors. Thank you, sir. Secretary Panetta, why does it matter in, in Monterey? It matters because it really is about the fundamental security of our country. And I think one of the things that marks the American people is not just their common sense and their spirit and their resilience, but it's also their willingness to secure not just their family, but their country. As Secretary of Defense, I had the opportunity to look into the eyes of our men and women in uniform at that time going to both Iraq and Afghanistan. And what I saw was a willingness on the part of these young men and women to put their lives on the line in order to fight and die for this country, to fight and die for this country. And so there are men and women from across this country who have assumed the responsibility of providing security and putting their lives on the line in order to defend this country. So it is incredibly important to what I call the American dream. I'm the son of Italian immigrants. I used to ask my parents, why did you come to this country? They came in the early 30s. They came from a poor area in Italy. And I never forgot my father's response. He said, your mother and I believe we could give our children a better life in this country. I think that's the American dream, giving our children a better life. And that's what this is all about. If we don't provide security for this country, if we don't deal with the threats that we're facing abroad, then we are not providing security. We are not providing the American dream for our children. Thank you. Coming up, how should the U.S. address the national security and economic risks of investing in China? Lawmakers from the House Financial Services Committee are weighing in. OpenAI's ChatGPT allegedly breaches data protection rules in Italy. The chatbot was already banned there once before, more shortly here on NTD News Today. The highest art is beautiful, breathtaking, timeless. First time I came in here was Monday, and today is Thursday. I've had two surgeries and am doing fantastic. I'm still in shock that I can walk 
That's all within four days. In fourth grade, I was diagnosed with scoliosis. I had 70 and 60 degree curvatures. Went to Shriners Hospital in LA. It's been fused ever since. I noticed a lot of pain going down my left buttock into my thighs and into my calf. I could be standing there and my legs would just go out. I went through pain management for two and a half years and the pain management specialist told me there was nothing more he could do for me. We actually did our own research and next thing I know, Dr. Benati called and he told me immediately over the phone what my issue was without even seeing me. I was in a twilight stage during surgery and you can actually say, where are you feeling that pain? And it immediately stops. Hold the leg up there. No pain here? No. No pain here? No. No pain on the butt? No. All of a sudden, they're all, do you want to get up and walk? Well, I couldn't walk before, and I got up, and I just started crying because I had no pain, and I had all my weight on my left leg and on my right leg, and I walked a straight line with no assistance, no falling, no grabbing onto the walls, nothing. I held my own weight, and that's the first time in months that I was able to walk by myself. Benati succeeds where others fail. For more stories like these and the rest of our program, check out American Medicine Today, featuring cutting-edge medical and science innovators and a medical professional's insight on political and social issues plaguing our nation and healthcare. American Medicine Today, Saturday 6 and Sundays at 9 on NTD Television and other streaming platforms. Losing the fear of looking foolish comes with age. Who did you steal him from? Losing your way in your own home doesn't. Confusion with time and place may be a sign of Alzheimer's. Mom, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Early detection gives you and your loved one time to plan for the future. Learn the warning signs of Alzheimer's. I'm going to bring you the most accurate and insightful information on NTD Newsroom. Join me weekdays right here on NTD News. The Biden administration is launching a working group with China to crack down on narcotics. A U.S. delegation led by Deputy Homeland Security Advisor Jen Daskal went to Beijing today. President Biden sent such a significant delegation to underscore the importance of this issue to the American people. At the closed door meeting, the two sides discussed methods to stamp out the shipment of Chinese chemicals used to make fentanyl. The launch of the working group follows years of no assistance from Beijing. President Biden had said cooperation would resume after meeting with the Chinese regime leader in November. Biden said at the meeting that Chinese is telling its chemical companies to curtail precursor chemical shipments to Latin America. A lot of synthetic drugs in the U.S. enter from Mexico, with precursor chemicals coming largely from China. The Chinese regime said it also resumed sharing information about suspected trafficking with an international database. And what should the U.S. do to address the national security and economic risks of investing in China? The House Financial Services Committee is holding a hearing to explore the issue. We must make sure that those investments do not harm the security of the United States and our allies. So while this should serve as a major warning to U.S. investors who haven't yet got the message about the risk of doing business with Chinese organizations, it should also be a reminder to Congress that we need to get this right. We've been debating around, uh, excuse me, we've been debating outbound investment screening for, uh, outbound investment screening for multiple Congresses and multiple White House administrations. The hearing is called Better Investment Barriers, Strengthening CCP Sanctions, and Exploring Alternatives to Bureaucratic Regimes. Witnesses say the U.S. needs to protect its national security and maintain its global technol technology leadership amid China's ambitions. Their suggestions include better transparency around investments made in China, additional prohibitions related to emerging technology, targeted outbound investment controls, and collaborating with allies. The witnesses say, named several sensitive technologies that the U.S. needs to pay attention to. They include quantum computing, artificial intelligence, 
semiconductor development, hypersonics, and supercomputing. Will Chinese property developer Evergrande follow a court order to liquidate? And what will be the impact on the Chinese economy if it does? NCD Business's Don Ma speaks to a specialist on the topic. And now joining us is Brian McCarthy from MacroLens. So to start off quickly, uh, give us your take on the whole Evergrande situation being ordered to liquidate. Yeah, certainly it, uh, the news hits in an environment of you know, extreme angst regarding Chinese equities. So it was, it was taken bearish by um, Chinese equity indices uh, last night. But in effect, I don't really think this is going to change the story all that much. Um, it's unlikely, in my view, that the domestic authorities in China will abide by an, a winding down order from a Hong Kong court. So if Chinese authorities are weighing the pros and cons, do you think it would be more beneficial for them to let things be as it is right now instead of liquidating? They don't seem to have a better plan. Um, to some extent, I'm surprised they haven't simply nationalized Evergrande, um, handed off the assets to state-owned developers, and had the state fill the hole in the financing to get these apartments delivered. Um, but I think the problem is the problem extends well beyond Evergrande. There are a number of developers that have unfinished apartments and terrible finances because the entire real estate market is effectively falling apart. So basically you're saying bluntly that uh, Chinese authorities are not going to listen to the order from a Hong Kong court. Uh, but maybe paint us a picture um, like if Evergrande were to be liquidated, what would the impact be on the overall economy in China? Yeah, I, I mean, it's almost impossible to imagine it being liquidated. Uh, I, you know, if, if they actually were to try to find a clearing price for Evergrande's assets, it would simply accelerate the, uh, you know, accelerate the process that's going on, which is we are finding what, out what these real estate assets are really worth, that some call it $80 trillion worth of Chinese real estate isn't worth $80 trillion, it's worth $40 trillion. All right, final question. Any way to fix the property crisis in China? No, there's no way to fix any of this. I know international investors keep looking around the next corner for some big policy, you know, bullet to, to fix this. There, there is no fixing it. You're going to take the value of residential real estate in China down by tens of trillions of dollars. All right, thank you thank very you. much, Brian McCarthy, Chief Strategist, MacroLens. Thanks, Tom. Beijing lodging a complaint to Washington over the treatment of Chinese students arriving to study in America. The Chinese regime alleged the students were interrogated for hours and in some cases deported. More details coming tonight at 9.30 Eastern on NTD's China in Focus with Tiffany Meyer. And now for a shift in gears, we have some short headlines from the UK, France and other European countries. Northern Ireland's largest pro-British party is planning to end a two-year boycott. Their protest of pro-Brexit trade rules had caused the region's government to collapse. The head of the Democratic Unionist Party now says they've reached a deal with the British government on those rules and that the government could be restored within days. This package, I believe, safeguards Northern Ireland's place in the Union and will restore our place within the UK internal market. It will remove checks for goods moving within the UK and remaining in Northern Ireland and will end Northern Ireland automatically following future EU laws. OpenAI's ChatGPT allegedly breaches data protection rules in Italy. The country's data protection authority is now pressing ahead with an investigation started last year. And last year, it banned ChatGPT over alleged breaches of European privacy rules. The service was later reacted, reactivated after OpenAI addressed the issues. Italy's authority now says OpenAI has 30 days to present defense arguments against the latest accusations. Over to Sweden's NATO bid, Hungary is the only country left to approve of the Nordic country's accession. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said on Monday he expects Hungary to approve Sweden's bid this week. This comes as Hungary's foreign minister was in Ukraine Monday. 
That's for talks with senior Ukrainian officials. His visit comes just days before a European Union summit. The summit will seek agreements on a financial aid package that has been held up in Hungary. Hungary has long criticized Ukraine for allegedly curbing the rights of ethnic Hungarians. We came here with the aim to rebuild the atmosphere of trust in our bilateral relations. I think we agreed that we have made encouraging steps towards this. There is still a long way to go and a lot of work will be needed, but we on the Hungarian side are ready to do the work and ready for further joint work. Farmer protests continue across multiple countries in Western Europe. Let's first take a close look at France. Farmers parked tractors across highways near Paris today. They blocked multiple lanes of a highway using bales of hay. In southern France, farmers set bales of hay ablaze to partly block access to an airport. France is the EU's biggest agricultural producer. Farmers say they're not being paid enough and are choked by excessive regulation on environmental protection. We're all children of rural workers and when we all are children and descendants of rural workers, we all should act to help our farmers live, survive, and not only survive but also to regain financial health and more. I think we have to understand today that French agriculture is in a catastrophic situation. And in Belgium, farmers parked their tractors in a central square near the EU parliament. They say they will stay until a summit of EU leaders on Thursday. Farmers are criticizing what they call overly strict environmental standards imposed by the EU. They say because of the rules, they're being undercut by foreign imports, which do not have to respect the same norms. We are asking the leaders to review their laws. They talk about being greener, but if that happens, then there will be land which isn't worked anymore. And it's difficult enough as it is. And if you have any news tips or feedback for our show, please feel free to email us at news.today at ntd.com. Car breakdown is no joke. With parts, labor, and towing, you could be looking at thousands of dollars in bills, darlings. That ain't funny. If your vehicle's out of warranty, it's not a matter of if, it's when your car will break down. Unless you call CarShield, America's most trusted auto protection company. Plans cover up to 5,000 parts and systems and provide protection anywhere in the country with a mechanic or dealership you choose, all for just one low monthly payment. And with the CarShield guarantee, your rate never goes up and your coverage never goes down, no matter how many claims you have. That's money in your wallet. Don't pay full price for an expensive repair bill when you could be covered. For car shield administrators to save us over $1,000, that's money that I could take and plan my next vacation. The car shield helped me save over $3,600. Plans through car shield can protect most major parts and systems in your car, including the engine, transmission, entertainment system, computers, electronics, and more. For dollars a day, your plan could save you thousands the next time your car needs a repair. The stressful situation that we thought we were going to have was not there. CarShield administrators took care of everything for us. If our car breaks down, CarShield administrators have our back. CarShield's coast-to-coast -coast protection also includes 24-7 emergency roadside services. That means help with lockouts, flat or damaged tires, even towing. When you've got a plan through CarShield, you're only one call away from their best coverage yet. Having a plan through Car Shield means dealing with a live administrator who gets you the help you need with your car. Including getting that repair bill paid. Save money and save the hassle. Call Car Shield now before a breakdown. Call Car Shield and get that Car Shield guarantee, where your rate never goes up and your coverage never goes down, no matter how many claims you have. But you've got to call Car Shield now before your car breaks down. Call 800 587 5179. 800 587 5179. The tempting online world is encroaching on our campus. Is unplugging cables and confiscating phones the solution to protect our children? No, we just need a clean multimedia platform. Join Ganjing Campus to leverage premium channel features, professional development courses, and kindness event toolkits tailored for teachers. 
Build a truly positive and interactive classroom community. Foster a pure and delightful learning environment for children. Parents, it's here. A world with amazing adventures and Christian messaging your kids will love. Introducing TruePlay, multiple games in one app. A safe and trusted platform. Go to TruePlayGames.com today to learn more. I'm Iris Howe at the White House, and we are NTD. Welcome to NTD News Today. Here are today's top stories. Suspected terrorists trying to come to the United States. More people on the terror watch list were caught trying to enter illegally in the last three months than in all of 2021. We bring you the exact numbers. House Republicans moving closer to impeaching DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. What are the allegations in the impeachment articles? House lawmakers shining a light on how an artificial intelligence can improve their efficiency. A hearing breaks down the benefits and risks of integrating AI into congressional operations. And in Illinois, an election board decides whether or not former President Trump and President Biden stay on the ballot. Arlene Richards brings us the latest. A veteran high school coach of 25 years resigns, saying he can't support Oregon's rules allowing transgender athletes to play in girls' sports. His resignation went viral online. Our conversation with him, coming up. And an American scientist is in hot water with the British. Her advice on their favorite hot beverage is stirring up controversy. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. Hi, I'm David Lamb, sitting in for Chris Beers. And to top the show, we have House lawmakers moving closer to impeaching Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. The House Homeland Security Committee is holding a markup of their impeachment articles against Mayorkas today. We're here today not because we want to be. But, but because we have exhausted all other options and our duty as members of Congress compels us to exercise our constitutional duty and defend this separate but equal branch of government. At the beginning of this Congress, each of us took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that we would well and faithfully dis discharge the duties of the office. This is the same oath I took many years ago in the Army. Several of you also took the same oath in your service to this nation. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas took a similar oath, but he has not lived up to it. The allegations in the resolution say Mayorkas committed high crimes and dis misdemeanors for his handling of the southern border. There are two articles of impeachment. One says Mayorkas willfully and systematically refused to comply with immigration laws. The other says Mayorkas breached the trust of Congress. The DHS criticizes the impeachment as Republican political games. If the House committee approves the articles of impeachment, the full House will take up the articles. Senior House Republicans are confident they have the support to impeach Mayorkas, but they can only lose two votes with their narrow majority. And suspected terrorists trying to cr come to the United States. The number of people on the terrorist watch list attempting to enter the country is on track to keep rising exponentially. So far in fiscal year 2024, Customs and Border Protection, or CBP, has encountered 50 individuals on the FBI's terror watch list. The number applies to individual individuals encountered between ports of entry at the southern border. The fiscal year began in October 2023. The 50 encounters are already higher than the total encounters for the entirety of fiscal year 2021, which was 16. In the years before that, the number was even lower with six individuals in 2018, three in 2019, and three in 2020. Former President Trump recently said the current situation at our southern border will lead to a major terrorist attack in the U.S. Meanwhile, Mexico's president on Monday said he's against closing the border. Well, that's not realistic. With all due respect, how are we going to solve migration problems with walls? 
How are we going to solve migration problems by closing the border? Why these proposals? Because elections are coming. Lopez Obrador suggests that U.S. politicians only bring up arguments to close the border to win votes. The Mexican president also said his nation is the main partner of the U.S. He points to high levels of economic and commercial integration, saying that's why the border can't be closed. Texas, meanwhile, continues to take its own action. State authorities are still putting up razor wire and fencing. The Lone Star State is also planning to start deporting people back to Mexico. Yesterday afternoon, Congresswoman Elise Stefanik praised the actions taken by Texas. Texas is the first line of defense against this full-fledged invasion at our southern border as Joe Biden and Secretary Mayorkas refuse to enforce our laws by rolling out the red carpet for illegal immigrants. Texas not only has the right to defend itself, but must take a stand for the sake of our country's sovereignty and future. And here to discuss the southern border and the articles of impeachment against Mayorkas is the Director of Investigations at the Immigration Reform Law Institute, Matt O'Brien. Matt, welcome. How do you interpret these proposed articles of impeachment? Well, I think they're right on the money. The fact is that executive officials, particularly at the level of Secretary Mayorkas, are charged with enforcing the law as Congress has written it. They're not entitled to make new policy and new laws without going through Congress. So what we have here is a clear example of an official who is ignoring the Immigration and Nationality Act in order to pursue another agenda, and that is a basis for impeachment. So that's despite Democrats saying that there's no legal basis for this description of high crimes and misdemeanor. You would say that there are there is a legal basis for that? Certainly, it's dereliction of duty. Uh, Alejandro Mayorkas, like everyone else who serves in the federal government, took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And implicit in that is that government officials are not above the law. The Immigration and Nationality Act binds Alejandro Mayorkas and the U.S. government to observe the conditions that Congress set forth for admitting people to the country. And what's happened is anyone who shows up at the border and mouths the magic words asylum, whether they have any legitimate claim to asylum or not, is being allowed into the country and then turned loose by the federal government. That's not border management. That's not in compliance with the Immigration and Nationality Act. So Matt, how do you see these impeachment proceedings potentially impacting the bipartisan efforts uh, to, to address immigration policy? Well, the bipartisan effort that's currently going on is a bit of a misnomer, and it's not clear to me uh, why the Republicans would be negotiating with the Democrats in order to get the Democrats to do what they're already bound by law to do. And the problem is, if they reach an agreement, then the Democrats are likely to just ignore that the way that they've ignored the immigration law that's already on the books. Now, President Biden has said that he's willing to shut down the border if it reaches a certain point and if Congress gives him the ability to do so. But we also know that there are many approaches that Biden could have taken to address the issues at the border already. Why do you think he hasn't used that route? Well, he's got a pretty clear route as uh, Trump v. Hawaii, the case decided by the Supreme Court, has already dictated. Uh, the president has the power to shut down the border under Section 1182F of the Immigration and Nationality Act. The reason that the Biden administration hasn't done that is because they want all of these people to come into the United States. Uh, the hope is that they're going to trigger another amnesty, give these individuals a path to citizenship, and then as a result, those individuals will all vote Democrat in order to thank the party that gave them a path to U.S. citizenship. And just lastly, Matt, you know, the impeachment articles criticize Mayorkas' implementation of the family reunification parole programs. Um, they're saying that these actions are unlawful. What's your stance on these, the legality of uh, this program and also within the broader context of border you know, control, how, how it's applied and how it works? Well, parole is a selective authority that's available for the convenience of the United States government. What it does is it creates a fiction that you are at the border seeking admission, but lets you physically into the United States. And it was never intended to be something that gave the president or any other government official uh, the ability to 
selectively undercut the various provisions of the Immigration and Nationality Act. And what the Biden administration has essentially done with parole is try and get changes that it couldn't secure legislatively to the Immigration Act put into place by executive policy. That's a flagrant abuse of presidential authority. And it's not good for the country. We have 6 million people that have been turned loose in the country. Nobody has any idea who they are, whether they're terrorists or criminals or cartel members. And at this point, virtually no one has any idea where they are and what they're up to. So that is not effective border management. And I think it comes down to what President Trump said. If you don't have a border, you don't have a country. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Matt O'Brien, Director of Investigations at the Immigration Reform Law Institute. Really appreciate it. Thank you. For more on the border showdown between Texas and the Biden administration and how a continued influx of illegal crossings will shape the U.S., I spoke with Jeffrey Tucker, founder of the Brownstone Institute and author of Liberty or Lockdown. All right, Jeffrey, thank you for joining us. Now, in a recent op-ed for the Epic Times, you wrote that there's a lack of reporting on the real scope of the border crisis and what's taking place. Um, why do you say that? It's extraordinary, actually. We, what's taking place in Texas and the political struggle over who controls uh, the border and what it means to be an American and to have uh, residency here uh, is all been thrown into question because the Biden administration is is deliberately and explicitly and overtly overriding uh, the rights of Texas to control its own property and its own borders and overriding the t Texas uh, uh, immigration authorities to do anything about the tremendous, unprecedented floods of numbers of people coming in. We're talking about millions and millions, and some people estimate as many as 20 million uh, people have come in in just the last, uh, since the Biden presidency began. And the Texas uh, governor is fed up, and it's not just the governor, it's a bipartisan issue throughout the entire state, and it only takes one visit to Texas. This is all anybody's talking about. This is very important stuff. The remarkable thing to me, and the thing I can't quite get is why this is not being covered by any of the mainstream corporate news. And we appreciate you being on, uh, on our show talking about this. So as millions of illegal immigrants enter the country, there's been a lot of concern that these individuals could somehow end up voting in elections, a uh, point which has largely been brushed off as a conspiracy theory by mainstream media. Most notably, Elon Musk drew attention to the fact that no proof of citizenship is required to vote in federal elections in Arizona, uh, a border state. Now, Jeffrey, uh, what's the reality here? Is there something to be concerned about? I'm not in any way an expert on this, but just looking at, uh, maybe I should be, and, and there probably are people out there who are, but just from looking at what I've seen from the verified data, there are serious problems here. Yes, it's technically against the law for non-citizens to vote in federal elections, but it's all a question of how are you going to verify citizenship? And so... Uh, and, and every state is allowed to set its own standards, which means that blue states have a very strong incentive to make it as loose as possible. So if you're just self-reporting on an absentee ballot, yes, I'm a citizen, does that count for federal elections? Apparently, the answer to that is yes, and that is not a conspiracy theory. And in your article, you mentioned that the Biden administration's actions in relation to the border are cementing a blue majority for the future. Now, uh, the Biden administration has said factors including an increase in authoritarian regimes, extreme weather occurrences, and increasing food insecurity has led to the increase of what is called irregular migration. The Biden administration also stated its commitment to uphold the U.S.'s humani humanitarian laws for those seeking asylum. Could these yeah. external factors and greater concern for asylum seekers, um, could this be an issue? I mean, could you ex explain what we're seeing here? No, I think the easiest explanation is that the border is wide open. And the Biden administration has signaled to the world, together with many non-government organizations, people facilitating this, uh, that anybody can come to the America, uh, to the United States, and and shoot it. And as we know, many cities are sanctuary cities, whatever, putting them up in fine hotels like New York City's doing. Um, 
uh, right now, even displacing residents out of the hotels and even asking people to give up their homes for them. So the whole thing is crazy. And we have to understand the scale of this is without precedent in American history. This doesn't compare to 1880 or 1890, nothing like that. We're talking about you know, 10, 15, 20 million people pouring in a, 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 a very few years. And consider all the the, the sheer numbers, and Ameri people need to realize that the sheer numbers that have yet to come, that could come, we're talking about, you know, not tens of millions, but hundreds of millions and even billions of people. So there's an unlimited number of people from whom the Biden administration can recruit to come to this country to permanently, permanently, change the demographics of voting in this country and allow unlimited forever voter fraud so you're basically ending democracy and the constitution there is so much at stake there's a reason why this issue is number one on voters minds even higher than inflation because it really really matters yeah we'll be keeping an eye on the border crisis jeffrey tucker thank you so much for joining us my pleasure thank you Coming up, a farmer is suing the state of Minnesota for discrimination based on race and gender. He and his legal team tell us the story. A near-death experience caught on camera. An Oklahoma police officer survived a deadly crash during a routine traffic stop. More in just a moment here on NTD News Today. look familiar? You probably think this is what owning hearing aids would be like. Let me tell you, there's a better way. The Atom by Audion Hearing. The all-new Audion Atom is the world's first wireless charging hearing aid under $100. The Atom comes with an easy-to-use wireless charging dock. Plus, the Atom has a 22% smaller design so it's nearly invisible when worn in the ear. That's why we have over 250,000 happy customers. Each pair has a 45-day money-back guarantee, so there is zero risk in trying them. Call 1-800-918-3109. That's 1-800-918-3109. Call 1-800-918-3109 or go to audionhearing.com to get your pair of Audion Atom hearing aids for only $99. We all know that words have power. They set things in motion. And make us happy or sad. But there's one word that stands out because when people say it, lives are changed. It's not a big word. It's itsy bitsy. It's only three little letters. But when you say it, the life of a kid like me can be changed. So what is this special word? It may surprise you. It's yes. 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 Yes to becoming a monthly supporter of Shriners Hospitals for Children. That's right. Your monthly support allows the doctors and nurses at Shriners Hospitals for Children to give the most amazing care anywhere and change the lives of kids like me. And me. And me. Because people like you have said yes. Now I can play football. And I can play catch. And I can walk. So what do you say? Will you say yes right now? It's so easy. All you have to do is pick up the phone or go to loveshriners.org right now and say yes. When you say yes to giving just $19 a month, only 63 cents a day, we'll send you this adorable love to the rescue blanket as a reminder of all the kids you're helping every day. My life is filled with possibility because of the monthly support of people just like you who called the number on your screen and said yes. 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 Your yes is making a difference in my life and the lives of so many other kids like me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving. Please call or go online now if operators are busy, call again or go to loveshriners.org to say yes right away. Hi, I'm Kelly Wright. We thank you for joining us and watching America's Hope here on NTD News. Bottom line is, 
I know you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, but let's give you some good news in the midst of the bad news. Watch us nightly right here on NTD News for a full dose of America's hope. President Biden said today he knows how he'll respond to the drone attack in Jordan. When asked by a CNN reporter on whether he's made the decision, Biden said yes, but did not provide details. He also said the U.S. does not want a broader conflict in the Middle East. Yes. I do hold them responsible in the sense that they're supplying the weapons to the people who did it. We'll, we'll have that discussion. And what are the potential rewards and risks of using AI in the day-to-day -day operations of Congress? The House Committee on House Administration is holding a hearing on the matter. By the end of the year, we saw several AI use cases emerging from our legislative branch agencies. For example, we've seen innovative experiments with optical character recognition to assist visually impaired library patrons. The U.S. Copyright Office is using AI to improve digital accessibility to copyright registration records and other data. Natural language processing has helped rapidly summarize legislation. And testing now enhanced search tools could help the public more quickly find government publications. The hearing focuses on how Congress can use AI to innovate effectively and efficiently while being transparent with the American public. Committee Chairman Brian Stiles says not only Congress, but other legislative branches like the Library of Congress or the Government Accountability Office can benefit from it. He also says his committee will also work on addressing the challenges of AI while taking advantage of its benefits. According to the committee's own reports, lawmakers and staffers are already using AI in a number of ways, such as drafting constituent correspondence, emails and bills, and correcting grammar. A farmer is suing the state of Minnesota for discrimination based on race and sex. Lance Nistler, a Caucasian man, said he was denied funding from a state agricultural grant despite meeting all eligibility requirements because the program prioritizes minorities. To learn more about his lawsuit, earlier I spoke with Nistler and his attorney, Andrew Quino. Lance and Andrew, thank you for being with us. Now, Lance, you want to purchase farmland in Minnesota using a government grant program, but you say you've been discriminated against because of your sex and the color of your skin. Tell us about your situation. My um, intent was to, to start and, and buy a chunk of land for myself to become my own farmer. So I applied for the grant. Um, I was actually picked ninth out of uh, 176 people. And so I, I, I was within the criteria to receive the, the down payment assistance. But because of the, um, you know, my race and gender, I was put to the bottom of the list. So then I no longer was able to to receive those those funds. Andrew, um, what laws do you allege that the state of Minnesota is violating here in uh, Lance's situation? And beyond Minnesota, how widespread is this alleged type of discrimination when it comes to grant programs more broadly? Yeah, Minnesota is in clear violation of the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Lance has a right to be treated equally by the government, by the state of Minnesota, without regard to his race and without regard to his sex or gender. So what they did to Lance by rigging the system against him because of those traits that he can't control is an egregious violation of our U.S. Constitution. This does go beyond Minnesota. Minnesota is not the only place where the government is discriminating against hardworking people, whether it is farmers or small business owners, based on these immutable traits and characteristics. We've seen in uh, places like, like Massachusetts, where small business owners are being discriminated against for COVID grant relief. Uh, in California, homeowners, first-time homeowners, are being discriminated against for assistance when it comes to buying their first home. 
So what's happening is the government cannot be relied on to restrain itself unless folks like Lance, who are brave enough to stand up for their rights, do it more often, then the government can, will continue to discriminate uh, despite the obligations under the 14th Amendment. Now, um, yeah, Lance, you were in ninth place, like you mentioned, and then you got shuffled back all the way till, till the end. Um, that must be devastating. It, you know, being here in America, have you ever considered like something like this, something like this would happen to you? No, I, I would have never guessed that. Um, yeah, to me, it, it seemed fair to have the lottery. You know, everyone that was able and in and, and that criteria as an emerging farmer could put in. And if you were fortunate enough to be picked in the lottery, it seemed fair enough to me. Um, and, and it didn't. Yeah, for, in my case, it didn't. You know, Andrew, uh, can you go over what requirements or what candidates is this grant uh, looking for? Yeah, this grant is favoring or looking after emerging farmers. It defines emerging farmers as those farmers that can categorize or identify themselves as, among other things, uh, racial minorities, uh, LGBTQ+, plus, uh, women farmers, uh, Native Americans. So those are the, the several of the categories that would benefit from, from this grant. Now, Lance, uh, even though he doesn't identify in any of those categories, is an emerging farmer. He's someone that is looking to buy his first farm. He's not owned a farm before. He's a relatively younger farmer who's setting out on his own uh, for the first time in Minnesota. So he should absolutely um, be eligible for this grant. But of course, because of what the state is defining as an emerging farmer, he is categorically excluded. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see where this case goes. So Lance, Andrew, thank you so much for taking the time with us today. Thank you Thanks so much, David. A veteran varsity coach resigned last week in Oregon, saying he couldn't turn a blind eye to policies in his state that allow boys to play in girls' sports. NTD's Daniel Monahan spoke with coach Dave Brown, whose video is announcing his decision that went viral on social Dave Brown was the coach of Camby High School girls' varsity tennis team in Oregon before resigning last week. Brown coached high school tennis for 25 years and basketball for 20 years before throwing in the towel. He says he couldn't stand by and let girls be put at risk anymore due to boys being allowed to play in girls' sports. Brown says he didn't anticipate the amount of hurt that was going on with girls and women out there. They feel like something's being ripped away from them and uh, they don't have any control over it. So we're just trying to be that voice for them. And, you know, being coaches, uh, one of our biggest responsibilities is to protect these kids. You know, if you're on a bus trip, you're on a way match, you know, game or whatever you're doing, there's there's boys in locker rooms everywhere in middle school and high school now. That's, that's a huge problem. Brown says a lot of high schoolers and middle schoolers disagree with the rules, but that it's hard to stand up due to all the blowback. When you're in high school, you don't want to draw a bunch of attention to yourself. And you, you try to get through there, go to Taco Bell, hang out with your friends, you know, go to the dance, go to the game, whatever. I mean, the last thing you want to do is get negative attention brought at you. And it, it's a tough time to be a middle schooler, high schooler. And I think college, too. And they can't really say much. They really can't. That's why the coach felt the need to make a stand. Dave's wife, Judy, also resigned from her position as an assistant head coach. Judy says they aim to protect the kids as much as possible. It goes back to how can you undress or even change? It's not like you're undressing totally, but just changing in front of a male. And there's males there that are changing. Um, we've had women who have talked about what they've been even going to the local YMCA or into a local um, swim pool area and having to have their grandkids and then change in front of those situations. It just, it just is, you know, you want to protect our kids as much as possible. Brown says he hopes they can try to encourage dads and moms to get more involved, get to school board meetings and speak up. We don't want to point fingers and slam on people. We just want to say, hey, these girls are important. And we want them to be able to look at us and say, we just didn't rubber stamp this like, you know, everybody else is doing right now. Coaches are in a really tough spot, though. And uh, it's not easy to speak up at a public school. And I, we know a lot of coaches don't agree with this. But if you want to keep your job, 
you probably have to go along with it. And that's got to change. Brown has a special appeal for dads to stand up. I think men have, have kind of been pushed aside a little bit and said, be quiet. And uh, men need to step up and be leaders, you know, in the home, in the community. Um, and that doesn't mean being a mean man. That just means being a man. Dave and Judy Brown have launched Dads for Daughters to encourage dads to protect and stand with their daughters in their fight to protect girls and women's sports. They also run the Stand Tall with Dave Brown organization. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. NTD reached out to Canby High School for comment on Coach Brown's resignation and his protest over boys playing in girls' sports. We have not heard back yet. And next, a near-death moment caught on camera. An Oklahoma police officer survived a major accident during a routine traffic stop. And just a warning, some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Officer Jesse Gregory is seen in the dash cam footage standing on the passenger side of a vehicle near a highway. Suddenly, a black SUV crashes into it, violently throwing him to the ground. Gregory quickly gets back up and runs out of harm's way. Luckily, all three people involved in the accident were treated and released. Oklahoma Highway Patrol said the accident happened on January 18th on Interstate 40. Coming up, will former President Trump and President Biden stay on the Illinois ballot? The election board decides. Two brothers are facing 130 criminal charges after homemade explosives, ghost guns, and a hit list were found in their New York City apartment. We'll have the details soon when we return. The highest art is beautiful, breathtaking, timeless, and moving. Experience art with 5,000 years of history, inspired by the divine. This is an ad part about hunger, and this is what you'd expect to see. Children starving in places like this. For years, things were getting better. We were beating hunger, and few children died. But now, things are getting much worse again. Because this time, the droughts are more devastating. Wars and conflicts are forcing us to flee our homes, leaving everything behind with no way to get food. That's why we need your help. Millions of children are fighting to survive due to inequality, conflict, poverty, and the climate crisis. Save the Children is working alongside communities to provide a better life for children. And there's a way you can help. Please call or go online to give just $10 a month, only 33 cents a day. We urgently need 1,000 new monthly donors in the next 30 days to help the children we support around the world. You can help provide food, medicine, care, and protection, plus so much more that a child needs by calling right now and giving just $10 a month. Because you can give hungry families the support they need to survive and stop children dying from hunger. All we need are 1,000 monthly donors in the next 30 days. Please call or go online now with your monthly gift of just $10. Thanks to generous government grants, every dollar you give can have up to 10 times the impact. And when you call with your credit card, we will send you this Save the Children tote bag as a thank you for your support. Children around the world really need your help. Your small monthly donation of just $10 could be the reason a child in crisis survives. Please call or go online to hungerstopsnow.org to help save lives today. The tempting online world is encroaching on our campus. Is unplugging cables and confiscating phones the solution to protect our children? No, we just need a clean multimedia platform. Join Ganjing Campus to leverage premium channel features, professional development courses, and kindness event toolkits tailored for teachers. Build a truly positive and interactive classroom community. Foster a pure and delightful learning environment for children. We're in the nation's capital asking the important questions so that you're in the know. 
Join us daily, Monday through Friday, on the Capitol Report on NTD News. Former President Trump will be staying on the primary ballot in Massachusetts. A justice from the state's top court denied a bid to disqualify him yesterday. The judge upheld an earlier decision from the state's ballot law commission. The panel dismissed the challenge because it didn't have jurisdiction to, dis to address Trump's eligibility to hold office. The judge in his eight-page decision said the challenge came too soon. He wrote any challenges against Trump need to wait until he formally secures the GOP nomination. Challengers to Trump's ballot viability can ask the full Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court to hear the case. Trump's legal team has convinced judges in Michigan, Minnesota, and other key states to throw out similar challenges. Trump remains on the ballot in Colorado and Maine, pending a decision by the U.S. Supreme Court on Trump's appeal. The high court is set to hear oral arguments in the Colorado case next week. A lawyer for Trump criticizing a recent report on the Trump Organization. The report was issued by a court-appointed monitor, Barbara Jones, who said she found inaccuracies in the company's financial statements. Trump's lawyer says Jones is using these inaccuracies to justify continued oversight of the company. Jones's report is part of Trump's New York civil fraud trial. Dr Judge Arthur Engeron appointed her in November 2022. Trump's attorney, Clifford Robert, criticized the report, saying the inaccuracies are minor and only simple math errors. Robert telling ABC News that the judge is forcing Trump to pay millions for the monitor, only to prove that he's done nothing wrong. The lawyer sent a letter to Judge Engeron on Monday. He accuses the monitor of twisting the report, so her appointment will continue and she'll keep making millions of dollars. And the Texas Republican Party chair is endorsing Trump. Matt Rinaldi published a statement on Monday acknowledging that party officials should remain neutral in primaries. But he wrote on X, the threat our nation faces from the Democrats, globalists, and fake Republicans that hand power to Democrats is truly extraordinary, he wrote. We need everyone in this fight. The Texas Republican primary is scheduled to take place on March 5th, also known as Super Tuesday. Polling averages show almost 80% of Texas Republican primary voters support Trump. The Illinois State Board of Elections is weighing if former President Trump can stay on the state's ballot. They met this morning to decide whether to accept a recommendation from a hearing officer. The officer recommended they dismiss a complaint to remove Trump from the ballot. Retired Judge Clark Erickson said that he believes Trump engaged in an insurrection. But because of the constitutional issues involved, the case should be heard by a court of law. We turn now to entities Arlene Richards for more information on the case. Arlene, who filed the, what are the arguments on both sides of this case? What can you tell us? Okay, so the, the case was filed by legally registered voters of Illinois, and they're generally saying that former President Trump did uh, incite the insurrection. And that uh, that happened on January 6, 2021. And I want to read to you some of the other things that they said in their complaint. So specifically, they state the events on January 6 were an insurrection. They say Trump attempted to get government officials and others to illegally overturn the 2020 election. Uh, they say he urged supporters to gather at the U.S. Capitol and protest and that he intended for the protest to lead to violence and forcefully prevent Congress from certifying the 2020 election results. And that all of this is a violation of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment or the Insurrection Clause, which is the clause that was created after the Civil War to keep the Confederates out of office. Now, the defense to that is the election board lacks authority. So the defense is saying that this election board in Illinois doesn't have the authority, the authority to determine a complex constitutional issue, which is this section three of the 14th Amendment, and that this involves presidential disqualification. So there are political questions involved, and this is something that belongs in the court of law. And they're saying the insurrection clause itself does not apply to the office of the presidency. And they say that Trump didn't engage in an insurrection anyway. So now there are several other states that have dismissed similar cases like this for various reasons, but most of them believe that this case belongs in the Supreme Court. Now, Arlene, a hearing officer who's a retired judge 
has said that the case belongs to the courts. Does the election board have to accept the recommendation? No, they don't. So he recommended this. He sent the recommendation to their general counsel. Now today, as you said earlier, there is a hearing ongoing as we speak. They are listening to the same arguments that were presented to the hearing officer. And then they will make a vote. Now this board is bipartisan. There's four Democrats and four Republicans, so there could be a split decision. I don't know. But if they decide that former President Trump should be removed from the ballot, then he will be removed. Uh, and. I would like to note that the hearing officer, who is a retired judge, he actually believes that Trump incited the insurrection. So that may have some influence over their final decision. So Illinois is not the only state with an election challenge against Trump. There are several other states that have received similar claims, and one of those cases is in the su Supreme Court right now. If this election board decides to remove Trump from the ballot, what happens next? Well, Trump will likely appeal it, of course, but I think because there is a case already in the Supreme Court, they should probably hold off on removing him from the ballot. They may say he should be removed, but they may not remove him right away, right? And so they'll wait until the Supreme Court makes its ruling. And depending on what that ruling is, all of these cases may go away, or one by one, these states are going to start removing Trump from the ballot. All right, thank you so much, Arlene. Always great to have you. And uh, for first time here today, that's <laughs> great too. Thank you. Now, there is one other matter that the Illinois... Now, yeah, thank you, Arlene. So the Illinois Elections Board will address another matter, a petition to remove President Biden from the ballot for allegedly allowing enemies of the state to gain entry in the U.S. over the southern border. We'll keep you updated on the board's decision. Two New York brothers are facing 130 charges for possessing a massive arsenal of weapons, a hit list of celebrities and authorities, and anarchist propaganda. The brothers were arrested following a six-month investigation after suspic suspicious charges of suspicious purchases of weapons components. Police executed a search warrant at their New York apartment on January 17th and discovered the arsenal weapons. The weapons include 3D printed guns, explosives, and ghost guns. Police say the weapons had the potential for, quote, horrendous carnage. If convicted, the brothers could face up to 25 years in jail. And the Justice Department issued a grand jury subpoena for documents to the Sergeant at Arms for the U.S. House of Representatives. The House clerk read on the floor yesterday a letter from the Sergeant at Arms informing the chamber of the subpoena. According to multiple news outlets, the subpoena involves a Democratic member and the misuse of funds. The identity of the member was not immediately clear, nor were additional details regarding the alleged misuse of funds, except that it had to do with security. The Justice Department declined to comment. And a Philadelphia jury has ordered Bayer, the company behind Roundup Weed Killer, the Roundup Weed Killer, to pay more than $2 billion to a man who got cancer after using the product. Bayer acquired agrochemical giant Monsanto in 2018. According to news release from the Klein and Specter law firm, a Pennsylvania man was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma after using Roundup for 20 years. Late Friday, the jury found Monsanto was negligent and that Monsanto failed to warn that Roundup is a defective cancer-causing product. The man's attorneys said the verdict, quote, sends a clear message that this multinational corporation needs top-to-bottom change. Bayer says it will appeal the verdict. We have an important prescription drug recall to pass along. Azurity Pharmaceuticals has recalled some of its ADHD and narcolepsy medicine after a different drug ended up in the pill bottle. The company says some of its Zenzetti tablets had an antihistamine medicine mixed in the package. Zenzetti is a stimulant used for the treatment of ADHD and narcolepsy. The antihistamine is a sedative and has the opposite effect of a stimulant. The recall warned people who take the antihistamine instead of Zenzetti could experience drowsiness. That could put pa patients at risk of getting into an accident or injuring themselves. The company says it has not received reports of anyone getting hurt because of the medicine mix-up. A blacksmith in Alaska forges knives and swords the old-fashioned way, demonstrating the value of traditional craftsmanship in modern times. 
And an American scientist is in hot water with the British. Her advice on how to enjoy their favorite beverage is stirring controversy. That and more after the break. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and I'm here to tell you about my new product from my pillow. Towels that actually work. Watch this absorbency test. Here's another towel that we randomly went out and bought. Here's one of my towels with a nice design. I don't know if you can see this, but you could line a swimming pool with this. I mean, this is crazy. Get rid of it. Towels that actually work. What a concept. I'm interrupting this commercial to let you know you can get our six piece My Towels, regular $69.98, now only $29.98. Or you can save 25% on our brand new kitchen towels made with the same technology as our famous My Towels. Also, we have bath sheets, bath towels, washcloths, hand towels, and so much more. And the best part, with your promo code, your entire order ships absolutely free. So go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen. Use that promo code to get deep discounts on all my towels. And for a limited time, your order ships absolutely free. To a child, this is what conflict looks like. Children in Ukraine are caught in the crossfire of war, forced to flee their homes. A steady stream of refugees has been coming across all day. It's bitterly cold. Lacking clean water and sanitation, exposed to injury, hunger. Exhausted um, and shell-shocked from what they've been through. Every dollar you give can help bring a meal, a blanket, or simply hope to a child living in conflict. Please call or go online to give now to save.org today with your gift of $10 a month. That's just 33 cents a day. We cannot forget the children in places like Syria, born in refugee camps, playing in refugee camps, thinking of the camps as home. Please call or go online to give now to save.org today with your gift of $10 a month. Your gift can help children like Ara in Afghanistan, where nearly 20 years of conflict have forced the people into extreme poverty. Weakened and unable to hold herself up, Ara was brought to a Save the Children Center where she was diagnosed and treated for severe malnutrition. Every dollar helps. Please call or go online to give now to save.org today with your gift of $10 a month, just 33 cents a day. And thanks to special government grants that are available now, every dollar you give can multiply up to 10 times the impact. And when you use your credit card, you'll receive this special Save the Children tote bag to show you won't forget the children who are living their lives in conflict. Every war is a war against children. Please give now. For the day's top headlines and the news you need to know, tune in right here to NTD Evening News. In our modern world, efficiency is valued above almost everything else, but some are still keeping traditional crafts alive. Trevor Barrett is one such person. The Alaska native is a mostly self-taught bladesmith. In his home workshop, Trevor forges hunting knives and swords the traditional way. Sweating over a coal-burning forge, striking hammer to red-hot metal, you would be forgiven for thinking you're in the smithies of Middle Earth. But Trevor Barrett does all of that at his workshop in Alaska. He describes himself as a full-time bladesmith. Born and raised in Kenai, Alaska, Trevor has been smithing knives for the last seven years. He grew up hunting and fishing in what he calls one of the last true wild places. This experience, he told NTD, is what inspired him to start forging his own blades. I started to want a more quality blade, one that I could rely on, and so I just one day decided I should try it out. So I went on to the internet and I looked up a lot of tutorials. Trevor eventually turned this hobby into a full-time job. He now sells his blade on his website, BarrettKnives.com. There's a wide selection from which to choose, from a set of stainless steel kitchen knives to Anduril, 
Aragorn's sword in The Lord of the Rings. When he started out, Trevor sought inspiration in fantasy, in particular J.R.R. Tolkien's seminal fantasy work. Being raised on, around the books and then being raised around the movies when they first came out, uh, that really hit a certain part of my life that inspired me to take it from just a simple, simple blades for hunting and to expand into something that a little more. But Trevor doesn't just make blades. He makes them the old fashioned way, hammer, anvil, and a forge. He said up to 75% of what he does is done without any modern technology, including electricity. And that's really helped me to appreciate uh, the craft more. So it's not about industry. It's not about production. It's about the um, history of this craft. Doing it this way, Trevor says he has learned to appreciate the importance of tradition. It's these traditional crafts and mindsets, he says, that have shaped human history and they must be preserved. He enjoys the business side of things, but his main focus is perfecting the craft. Trevor also found that in the fires of his forge, he was able to shape himself. It's still helping me to kind of really develop my own mindset and to develop my own character through the patience, the dedication, and the humility that's involved. On his social media platforms, Trevor describes himself as husband, father, bladesmith. His family comes first. Taking up a traditional craft like bladesmithing at his home workshop has allowed him and his wife to be available for their one-year-old son. It's important that I show more, in my opinion, more traditional mindset in the sense that I'm able to be there for my son. And then hopefully as we move on, be able to teach him that sometimes it's good to slow down and to appreciate some of these things that a lot of people may accidentally start to kind of push to the side. It's Trevor's hope that the work he is doing will help shape not only his life, but the next generation as well. The goal now is to raise our son and build the shop a little bit more and be able to just hopefully one day either pass it on to my son or just, you know, allow him to have a part of that as he grows up. Trevor is also working to spread his love for smithing. He's working on a project called Northfire Bladesmith School. Currently, it exists as a blog, but Trevor hopes to expand it into an online and eventually in-person class, an opportunity to learn the art from a modern-day master. And an American scientist has sparked a storm in a teacup across the pond. The esteemed chemistry professor is offering Britain advice on its favorite hot beverage. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more on the controversy. Chemistry professor Michelle Frankel from Bryn Mawr College is in hot water. In her book, Steeped in Tea, Frankel suggests adding warm milk and a pinch of salt to tea. Frankel says adding a small amount of salt makes tea seem less bitter. She explains that the sodium ions in salt block the bitter receptors in our palates. What makes this cup of tea taste less bitter? It's kind of a rescue thing. But the salt suggestion has created a transatlantic conflict. Tea lovers in Britain are outraged. The U.S. Embassy in London intervened, assuring the U.K. that salt and tea is not official U.S. policy. In this Manchester tea room, Des Davies hosts a tasting for his regular customers. They're being served two cups. One has traditional English tea, the other with Professor Frankel's suggestion. Davies isn't impressed with the new concoction. Definitely not for me. It tasted more like I'd actually made the cup of tea using seawater. Traditional English tea is also known as high tea, and it has been a ritual for centuries. London hotels serve elaborate tea in ornate rooms, accompanied by cake. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Kobe is some of the finest beef in the world. A Japanese butcher is making croquettes out of it, and people can't seem to get enough. Asahiya Butcher Shop has a whopping 43-year-long wait list for its Kobe beef croquettes. Beef lovers who want to sample these snacks will have to use their imaginations for a while. For those willing to wait, a box of five goes for $18. These croquettes are essentially deep-fried potato and beef dumplings. They were originally created as a way to introduce customers to the shop's other Kobe beef offerings, but they turned out to be a surprise hit. Asahiya briefly stopped selling the croquettes due to the excessive wait time, but customer demand led them to bring it back. 
And Thanksgiving has come and gone, but a wild turkey got some people talking in Ohio the other day. This happened recently in Pepper Pike, a suburb of Cleveland. This turkey was on the loose and stopped in the middle of an intersection. So a couple of police officers jumped in to help the bird get to safety. The officers managed not to ruffle the turkey's feathers, and they helped to turn the bird over to the state's Natural Resources Department. The agency is hoping to find a new home for the turkey, far away from traffic. And in a similar encounter in the UK, commute chaos ensued at a train station this morning when a swan appeared on the tracks, causing a 15-minute delay. The incident disrupted trains running between Cambridge and London. British commuters often joke about the wrong kind of leaves on the line, causing train delays. This time, the culprit seems to be the wrong kind of bird. But that's all for today's news. Thank you for tuning in. Feel free to reach out to us with news tips or feedback at news.today at ntd.com. We'll be back with more stories tomorrow. There are real consequences to controlled media. And NTD's founders know them firsthand. Our freedom of thought is the price. This is the lesson that guides us in everything we do. So there's the tear gas there. We know the value of a free society. And we take seriously the responsibility to preserve it. We are NTD.